And welcome all to our first Abical 2022 keynote uh, entitled, What Have We Learned? COVID-19 and the Possibilities for Digital Pedagogy. This will be given by a scholar that I have always been inspired by, Professor Kathleen Fitzpatrick, who is the Director of Digital Humanities and Professor of English at Michigan State University, where she also directs MES Edge, a research and development unit focused on, the, focused on the future of scholarly communication. She is project director of Humanities Commons, an open access open source network serving more than 30,000 scholars and practitioners across the humanities and around the world. And she is author of several books, including the most inspiring and most recently published Generous, Generous Thinking, a radical approach to saving the university. She is present, uh, president of the Association for Computers and Humanities, and she is president of the board of directors of Educopia Institute. Kathleen, we are very honored to have you with us today. <laughs> Thank you so much. I'm really delighted to get to be here with you. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen so that you can get my slides. Um, I am assuming that those are coming through, that you can see um, my slides at this point. Okay, great, thank you. I'm, I'm really delighted to have the opportunity to talk with you today. And you know, while I would of course rather be with you somewhere in some delightful location, um, it's really wonderful that, that conference technologies have developed in a way that allow us to be together even when we can't physically travel um, to be in the same place. So my focus today um, is on the kinds of things that we've learned about digital communication from the pandemic and the ways that we might continue experimenting and learning in order to better engage our students and colleagues. Now, my original title, as Najla um, just reminded you, um, it, it calls out digital pedagogy in particular. But as I wrote this talk, I felt the need to bracket that just a little bit, um, in, in large part because I'm not a scholar of teaching and learning. Um, and those who are will no doubt have very different lessons to share from the last two years. But I am very much a digital scholar. Um, I'm focused on developing platforms and communities that I believe can help us improve scholarly communication for both research and teaching. And so the thoughts that I'm going to share with you today um, have to do with the ways that better use of better digital tools might help us connect with our students, um, with our subject matter, and with one another. Now, I don't have easy answers or perfect solutions um, for any of this. In fact, as you'll hear, um, I have some real concerns, but I also have a few ideas that I hope that we can carry with us as we think about what higher education might look like in the future. Mm. There. Now, the very existence of this talk makes evident the first of the things that I think we've learned since the onset of COVID-19, um, that we can do a lot of things at a distance that we previously had to travel for. And in the process, we can include many more people in our discussions who might otherwise not have been able to participate. So platforms like Zoom, like Slack, like Miro, like GitHub, all of them present important possibilities for collaboration at a distance. Right? They've made it possible for us to work closely with others, not just under lockdown conditions, but in a more normal day-to-day -day environment with team members who are in different cities or countries. Now, my own team um, who are working on building and sustaining Humanities Commons um, has become increasingly distributed during the pandemic. Um, we've hired four new team members in the last two years, at least two of whom will be permanently remote. And our, our use of things like shared calendars and video conferencing and online project management tools and team chat has enabled us to ensure that we all stay connected, informed, and engaged in our shared projects. We similarly have the potential to reach students who can't join us in person, right? Students who are tied to a particular location, but nevertheless want to study with us. 
students who have temporary or chronic illnesses and disabilities that restrict their movements, students whose work schedules or family circumstances impose requirements on their time. This digital engagement can be primarily synchronous, right? Focusing on the kinds of discussions that we can best have when we're all connected at once. Or we can open the possibilities for students to engage in more asynchronous ways, right? Chatting with one another and sharing their work at whatever hour they can. And these platforms can be used as an alternative to regular face-to-face -face classroom meetings, or they can supplement those meetings. And if we deploy them well, we have the potential to use the network platforms and systems that are proliferating around us to make connections with our students and among our students in ways that can enable more of them to connect and participate. However, um, these platforms are not a panacea, right? And in fact, they create or they have the potential to create new barriers to our work together if we're not careful. Our students don't have equal access to computers or to high speed internet, and they haven't received equal levels of preparation for the use of technologies um, that their educations may require. We all also, students and faculty alike, have different levels of tolerance for screen time, right? For some of us, the video aspect of Zoom enables a sense of connection, but for others of us, it's purely exhausting, right? We might turn away from the screen or turn off the camera in order to protect ourselves from that exhaustion, and yet we might simultaneously experience a loss when others do the same, right? When we find ourselves talking to a bunch of black boxes. Um, we might be relieved to have a means of making something like contact with one another at the very same time that we feel our distance from one another all the more acutely. Right? We may be glad to zoom into one kind of meeting, but not another. Um, we might wish we could have more intimate conversations with one another and yet flinch every time a meeting organizer says breakout rooms. Right? So the ways that our engagements with one another are mediated um, by online platforms for connection are complex and using them in ways that are more inclusive and more likely to produce connection requires an ongoing willingness to experiment. So the Humanities Commons team is part of that larger lab that I direct um, called Mesh Research. Right now, we have two primary projects with two separate teams. Once a month, we have a Zoom meeting with the whole lab as a means of trying to keep everyone inform informed about both projects and to keep a sense of connection across the team as a whole. Those calls haven't been terrifically effective, however, and I often feel as though we're having a meeting just for the sake of having a meeting, which is just awful, right? So we've been experimenting with some other modes of connection in order to tease out what kinds of interaction might best support our needs. A few months ago, um, we decided to have what we called an asynchronous meeting, um, asking everyone to dip in and out of a chat, a text-based chat in Teams, over the course of a few hours one afternoon. Um, so I opened up this chat with a few questions, and the chat just flew. Um, we got more members of the lab actively involved and contributing than we've ever had in a video call. And in our conversations afterward, we surfaced a couple of reasons why. Um, one was novelty, right? It was an interesting experiment and everyone was eager to see how it would go. But our ostensibly asynchronous chat, which actually turned out to be pretty synchronous um, because everyone was there and active at the same time, um, that, that text-based nature of the chat made it possible for everyone to contribute ideas as they had them, rather than you know either needing to wait until they had the floor or feeling as though the moment for the idea that they were going to contribute had passed, right? So everyone felt free to add thoughts, to open new questions, or even just to plus one things to indicate connection. Now, we haven't had um, another chat-based meeting like this one yet, um, but it's opened up some key ways of thinking for us about how we might better use our chat platforms and about what video meetings are really best used for. 
Incidentally, um, one of the best resources that I've found for thinking about how to create inclusive remote workplaces, and I think this implies to remote classrooms as well, um, is GitLab's Guide to All Remote. Um, the, the site is a bit overwhelming um, because there is so much here, right? But dipping in a little at a time reveals several key principles that I think we could all bear to learn from, um, you know, such as documenting everything in writing and for a team that's working on a particular project, creating a handbook, a handbook first approach to that documentation so that there's a single location in which everyone knows that the answers to questions can be found. Now, there's a lot more in the site um, that I think can provide some ideas for creating better engagement using digital platforms. So I hope, I hope you'll dip into that. Among um, the worst recent developments in technologies for remote work, however, is the overflow of monitoring software, right, which reveals a whole lot about the worst tendencies, both in contemporary tech development and in contemporary management. Now, early on in the pandemic, we saw a lot of articles that suggested that businesses might be able to let go of their expensive office space because the sudden requirement that everyone work remotely made clear that everyone could work remotely, right, and still get things done. Um, so for the moment, I'll bracket the challenges that many of us still faced in that process, such as the lack of sufficient, comfortable workspaces for everyone in the home and the need to handle the demands of work and home life simultaneously. But I still want to note that these challenges demonstrated um, the extent to which a techno-utopian vision of remote work relied on the kind of frictionless universe that hard Hardly any of us get to experience. But following quickly on the heels of that initial crazy optimistic flush of let's just work from home forever um, came a welter of concerns. And many of those concerns revealed the deep insecurities of many, many managers, right? Because if the role of manager in the workplace is to require accountability and to make sure that their direct reports are actually working, um, how can they do so if they can't see that you are at your desk. Now, the answer from the tech industry, of course, was you can see what your employees are doing, even at a distance, and voila, monitoring software. So in the business world, this software can spy on your every computer-based move, um, watching what programs you're actively using, whether you're typing or using your mouse, and more. In the virtual classroom, monitoring software can track attention, right, by insisting that students keep the relevant program in focus, and they ostensibly prevent cheating by observing what else students are doing during class. And we've all seen the gross violations of privacy and basic human dignity that have resulted from the use of such monitoring programs. Employees who've been reprimanded because their children ask them questions during the workday. Students who are required to allow their cameras to scan their bodies and their surroundings and track their movements during testing. Um, but there are hundreds of other less visible intrusions that the technologies that we use for remote work inflict on us as well, right? Ways that our communications and our actions are tracked and consumed by the platforms that we're using. One small example, among the communication platforms that have been provided to my team by our host institution, Michigan State University, is Microsoft Teams. Um, now, Teams provides both chat-based communication like that of Slack and video-based communication like that of Zoom, and it integrates mostly pretty well with the other Office 365 applications that MSU offers. Um, not long ago, though, my colleagues and I realized that whenever we would hold a scheduled meeting via Teams, the meeting organizer would get an attendance report at the end of the session. Right. Because our Teams instance has been optimized for instructors to use for holding classes, this is no doubt meant to be a benefit, right? You don't have to worry about the awkwardness of taking attendance each day because we can handle it for you. 
But when I schedule a meeting with my colleagues, do I really need a report that includes what time each of us connected and disconnected from the call? And even more importantly, when that report gets generated, who else has access to it? I mean, almost certainly my colleagues in central IT. And of course, it's also generated by and served from a farm of Microsoft servers. Now, does anybody but me really care about that information? Probably not. Would anyone else look at it? It's, it's highly doubtful, um, particularly in any detail. But in the aggregate, what happens to all of that information? How long does that information live on university or corporate servers? And what kinds of research is being done or could in the future be done with it? Now, this question takes us into the terrain of big data, right, which, as we've been told, um, can enable research that can help us answer previously unanswerable questions. And that potential is really exciting. Um, within literary studies, for instance, we can explore questions at a never before possible scale. Right. So rather than making an argument about the nature of a literary genre or a literary period based on evidence found in reading a few dozen books, we can instead ingest and process thousands of texts to see whether our hypotheses hold. And so scholars like Ted Underwood at Illinois and Richard So at McGill bring the methods of data science to bear on large scale text corpora in order to ask enormous questions about genre, about culture, about race, and more. Um, throughout the pandemic, we've seen the importance of projects that seek to gather and manage and preserve data, like the volunteer-run COVID tracking project, which for one year gathered, rectified, and confirmed information across the United States on testing, on patient outcomes, and more, and in fact provided a far more reliable source of data than our own governments, um, such that the project's data were cited in more than a thousand journal articles articles, over 700 news stories, I'm sorry, 7,000 news stories, and much more. So the bigness of this big data enabled research into, for instance, the disproportionate effects of COVID-19 on Black, Indigenous, Latinx, and other communities of color within the United States, as well as into racial inequities in access to treatment. But this project only worked as long as the data kept flowing, right, within the U.S. context at least, as soon as state and local authorities slowed the tracking of testing data, the public perception that the pandemic was over grew, and attention to the real dangers faced by some individuals and communities withered. Hmm. There we go. Um, big data projects like these are, are also beset, or at least should be beset, by a host of ethical concerns. Um, as the Johns Hopkins University's COVID dashboards um, exploration of the ethics of digital contact tracing indicates, um, their principles include statements noting that only those data that are necessary and relevant for the stated public health purposes should be collected, that identifiable data should be stored in a secure manner and only for the period of time that the public health purposes require, and that adopted technologies should not be used in ways that subject communities to discrimination or surveillance for non-public health reasons. So these principles indicate an awareness that big data sets like these are not necessarily neutral and that where individuals or communities are identifiable within the data, they can be subject to severe consequences. As Kathy O'Neill in her book, we Weapons of Math Destruction, and Virginia Eubanks in her book, automating inequality have demonstrated the kinds of data that big powerful tech companies and government agencies are drawn together, and the algorithms in which those data are used work to exacerbate in inequities across contemporary culture. Okay, so what does this mean for the kinds of technologies that we've been deploying in higher education and the platforms that we've widely adopted and used in our teaching over the last couple of years? Um, first, 
we need to know much more than most of us do um, about what becomes of the data that our use of these platforms generates. Right? What is gathered, what is stored, who has access, and for what purposes. And this is particularly true of those venture capital funded platforms that provide free access to end users. Um, we need to ensure that their path to profit doesn't lead to selling user data for advertising or other commercial purposes. Now, in the case of Teams and that attendance report, I know that my university has negotiated an enterprise agreement with Microsoft that provides for compliance with two U.S. policies, HIPAA and FERPA, that require certain protections for healthcare data and education data, respectively. As part of that agreement, according to our IT services unit, Microsoft has committed not to, and this is a quote, mine individual data and will only access that data for troubleshooting needs or malware prevention. Okay, so that gives me a level of confidence that other platforms don't or won't, but it's still just one small step in developing the ethical platforms that higher education needs. The key really is remembering that technologies are not neutral. Right? The argument that they are neutral um, derives from a long history of work on digital media that swung between wild techno-optimism in which new networks and platforms were going to revolutionize all our lives and render discrimination and injustice and even the nation state obsolete to, on the other side, deep technophobia in which the very same networks and platforms were going to make all of us stupid and render us compliant subjects of totalitarianism. Now, if these arguments were thesis and antithesis, the apparent synthesis was to say, hey, now, you know, technologies in and of themselves are neither good nor bad. It's all a matter of how we use them except that the development of each and every one of the networks and platforms that now connect us was conceived of and executed by humans, right? With human biases and human goals. And because of that, while we might not want to say that technology with a capital T is good or bad, we nevertheless have to acknowledge that particular technologies are abusive and intrusive and encourage the worst in human behavior precisely because they have been designed and operated that way. Now, I imagine that the folks who invited me to give this keynote, um, who asked me to talk about the exciting possibilities for real engagement with digital tools and teaching and research, um, have spent at least the last few minutes thinking this is not what we meant. Um, and I'll acknowledge that the last several years um, have really sorely challenged my usual tendency toward optimism. Um, but this is the point at which I attempt to turn it all around, right, and get back to the idea that I started with, which is that digital networks and platforms can enable more participation by more people than ever before, and think about how we can do that ethically. Um, because we can do it ethically, right, if we carefully consider which technologies we're using and why. And that means both which technologies our institutions are investing their scarce financial resources in and which technologies we're investing our time, energy, and ideas in. We need to focus on the potential for higher education to help create a better world. Right? But in order to do so, we need collectively to rethink the systems through which we develop and share knowledge um, with one another, with our students, and with the world, and right? ensuring that we keep our eyes on the larger project of collective understanding that's at the heart of the academic mission. And this mission requires us to open many of our conversations, to find ways to treat knowledge not as what economists would call a club good, right, whose access is restricted to those who are in, on the inside, but instead as a public good, right, created for all, available to all. Now, this reclamation of higher education as a public good is at the heart of what I've called generous thinking, using our collective knowledge and the technologies that connect us in ways that demonstrate our deep responsibility for the world around us. 
I mean, we are, after all, educating the leaders of tomorrow, um, not just in the conventionally understood political and business realms, but in the kinds of engagement that will help their communities grow from the grassroots up. And doing that generous work demands a values-first approach to higher education, as well as an ongoing examination of how those values are instantiated in, in institutional structures and systems, and especially in the infrastructure that we use for our teaching and research. Um, our campuses have become dependent on a wide range of platforms that deliver our core services, right? Learning management systems, student information systems, publishing and communication systems, research information management systems. But by and large, right, these are platforms over which we, the academy, have very, very little control. Um, they're vendor owned, they're corporation controlled, and as such, they're far more responsible to their shareholders than they are to us right, or, to their or to our students. These platforms appear to serve needs that we can't fill ourselves, um, and yet there's no sense of service in their relationship to our institutions. Right? There's only extraction. Right? They take in our content, they take in our metrics, they take in our vast and growing annual fees, and they leave us dependent, right? privatized, beholden to economic forces that do not serve the public good. So this is just one of the reasons why my colleagues and I have been working to develop an open source, open access, nonprofit, academy owned and governed alternative to such extractive corporate platforms. Humanities Commons instantiates several key principles. Um, first, that higher education will benefit from all of us doing more of our work in connected ways on open platforms that enable more people to participate where the publics that we need to support our institutions can see the significance of what we do. And second, that those of us who work in institutions of higher education must do everything that we can to resist and reverse the privatization and data extraction that's overtaken them. Where our institutions are buying into extractive technologies, we need to protest and press for alternatives. And where we and our colleagues are using extractive and abusive platforms for collaboration, we need to find alternatives there as well. Right? We need to move our scholarly community or conversations away from platforms like Facebook, right? that we know are not only selling user data, but actively contributing to the spread of misinformation and the rise of authoritarianism. We likewise need to move researcher profiles and data sharing away from platforms like academia.edu or ResearchGate that may have less global consequences, but nonetheless engage in abusive email practices, tracking user behavior, and mining user-contributed content. If we instead focus our efforts and our support on platforms in which we can have some measure of confidence, right? Platforms with transparent financial reporting, with ethical privacy policies, and with open governance processes, we have the potential to build new kinds of collaborations and new kinds of communities, and to open the work that we do on campus to more people than ever before. So in this way, we can restore service to the public good, not just to our institution's mission statements, but to the work that they do in the world. And in doing so will require us to reserve our investments and our labor for systems and, and platforms and infrastructures whose missions genuinely align with our own, whose values mirror our own, and to whose governance we can contribute. And this is where Humanities Commons comes in. Um, just a bit of background um, for those of you who may not be fil fully familiar with the platform. Um, Humanities Commons was originally developed as a project of the Modern Language Association. Um, the MLA is the largest scholarly society in the humanities, and it represents scholars across North America and around the world who teach and study a very wide range of literatures, languages, and cultures. In 2013, with support from the Mellon Foundation, the MLA launched its own social network, MLA Commons. 
Alliance, um, which was intended to provide members with a platform for communication and collaboration. Um, but within about 30 seconds of launching that platform, we started to hear from our members about the desire to connect with colleagues in other areas in the humanities. And so we started looking for ways to support those connections across fields. So with further support from Mellon, um, we first undertook a planning process and developed a pilot project designed to connect multiple proprietary commons instances, each serving the membership of a scholarly society. Um, Humanities Commons went live with this set of pilot partners in December 2016, um, linking MLA Commons with common spaces designed for each of those other scholarly societies. But beyond providing space for those partner organizations, we also wanted to provide a central hub where any researcher or practitioner anywhere in the world could create an account and share their work. And as a result, we made the decision to open the Networks Hub to anyone who wants to join across the disciplines, around the world, regardless of institutional affiliation or organizational membership, and without cost to them. All Humanities Commons members um, can take advantage of all of the network's features, and they can create rich professional profiles, they can participate in private or public group discussions, they can create websites, and they can deposit and share their work in the network's open access repository. Over the years since we've launched, um, several instructors have hosted classes using the Commons, engaging their students through our discussion groups and websites. And in March 2020, our colleagues at the MLA offered Commons users a new site theme called Learning Space, um, which they designed in order to allow instructors to move their courses online fast, right? creating course schedules, assignments, lessons, and discussions. Now, building these open platforms and keeping them functioning is not something that any of our scholarly societies or institutions can do independently by themselves, but it is something that we can do together, right? We can build and share and maintain the infrastructure that will allow all of us to open education, right? To, to make the knowledge that we develop for and with our students a public good. Humanities Commons is working to provide that infrastructure to encourage organizations and institutions to invest in this shared network, to support it in an ongoing way, and to take an active role in shaping its future. Now, in order to ensure that the platform continues to operate with academic values front and center, we've not only developed a governance model that provides both institutions and end users that ability to guide the platform's development, but we've also launched a site um, called Sustaining the Commons, on which we regularly post our financial reports, um, the minutes of our governance meetings, our technical roadmap, and more. We've also created a privacy policy that is clear that the content that you share with the network belongs to you, that we will not sell it under any circumstances, and that we will only study non-personally identifiable information in the aggregate in order to ensure that we are serving our community's needs and living up to our values of openness, equity, and transparency. So Humanities Commons today has over 30,000 members um, from across our fields and around the world, um, many of whom are actively using the network to share their work, to collaborate with their colleagues, and to engage their students. It's a learning community in the best possible sense, right? Not only do we want our users to learn from one another, but we want to learn from them as well. Right? We hope that Humanities Commons might demonstrate some of the possibilities for ethically developed and operated digital platforms, and we hope that you'll join us there. Um, and in particular, I, I hope that you'll join me in the hands-on session to follow, um, in which I'll walk you through the process of setting up an account and getting started in the network. So it's, it's been an absolute delight um, to get to talk with you today. I'm looking forward to hearing what questions and thoughts you have. And um, thank you very much again for having me. Thank you very much, uh, Kathleen. Uh, there have been um, a number of interesting comments <laughs> in chat. And I'm sure a lot of people have some interesting questions 
Yes, um, let's see. So um, we have a comment by Dimitris. Would you like to um, read your comments, uh, Dimitris, and tell us what's the context of the contract with Cisco? Uh, yeah, uh, thank you, Kathleen. Uh, I got very excited and started <laughs> typing in the chat during your talk. Uh, yeah, one of the things you mentioned about our private uh, personal information and uh, here in Greece, uh, during the pandemic, uh, the Greek government, the Ministry of Education, signed a contract with Cisco to provide WebEx for all public schools. Um, and then uh, it, uh, it happened in a way, in a rushed way. And then people realized that all their uh, personal information uh, were transferred to Cisco. And no one was asked about that. And now teachers are uh, are striking back with a class action lawsuit. Oh, excellent. I'm glad to hear about that lawsuit. Um, yeah. I mean, there's been a lot of that. I think everyone was in such a hurry um, to make the transition and to pick up whatever technology they felt like was going to work. And it it took a while for people to realize the consequences of some of those agreements that got signed, um, because many of them are very loose about who owns what in the process. Um, so, you know, there was a period um, very early on in the development of Zoom, pre-pandemic, right, when people were still using things like WebEx was was pretty dominant, um, Skype was pretty dominant on a person-to-person -person level. Um, but, you know, Zoom had started emerging as one of these platforms that we use, and it worked so much better than, I mean, like it was reliable, the video was good, it was like everybody was so excited about Zoom. And then it turned out that the reason why it worked was because installing Zoom on your computer installed a tiny Zoom server on your computer. And so all kinds of information was potentially accessible through that Zoom server that was locally installed. There was a big furor and Zoom realized that maybe people didn't like that very much um, and they re-engineered to eliminate um, that, that local installation of the server. Um, and thankfully all of that happened before the pandemic um, so that when everyone started adopting Zoom, we weren't suddenly all you know part of a great big hive computer owned by Zoom, um, but instead you know had at least a little bit more protection. Um, from from this kind of intrusion into into our digital lives. Uh, yes, uh, Kim Fox also has an interesting question. Kim, would you like to ask your um, express your concern about posting your sure. research article? Yeah, go ahead. Sure, I'm just looking for solutions for academia that edu and research date when you're trying to get your scholarship out there but you can't publish through that publisher as open access because it's cost prohibitive it's like right. there's there's always a thread so just looking for solutions like where to put them and Maha had suggested in your university's digital repository for example uh, but that comes with an embargo period so mm -hmm. I just want to know what your solutions are well, my solution is humanities commons. Um, I, we are, are really trying to provide an alternative ethical space um, that will allow researchers to post anything, any of their, their research content that they want to post, um, whether it's preprints or postprints, um, whether it's, you know, uh, lecture notes or slides, your syllabi, anything that is the, the product product of your work, you can post in our repository. Um, posting it in the repository gets a DOI or a digital object identifier assigned to it, which both makes that 
um, that object that you post permanently findable, right? Regardless of what happens to our URL or if things move, that DOI remains stable throughout. Um, but the DOI also, because of its stability, gets used as a means or is able to be used as a means of finding out like what kinds of impact something has had um, for your annual review purposes, for instance. So we can find out about the numbers of downloads um, that, that the object has had. Um, the, the good news is um, we're, we're way less intrusive. We don't email you um, and we don't, um, we, aren't trying to make a profit off of the content that you share with us. And this is the primary concern that I have about academia.edu and ResearchGate. Academia.edu in particular um, has received tremendous amounts of venture capital funding. And at some point, they have to turn a profit in order to satisfy their funders, right? They're not going to be able to continue um, receiving that kind of external support otherwise. And the, the pathway that academia.edu has set to profit, I mean, first of all, as you all, all of you who use it know, they're constantly trying to upsell you on the, the paid version of it, um, which fine, if you wanna pay for it, that's great, but that's not enough for them to produce a real profit. Um, so what they're doing is mining the content of things that are shared via the network and figuring out from that content what research trends are and selling reports on those research trends to corporate entities. Um, and that I find, frankly, appalling. Um, if, if, you know, we are producing this work, um, uh, as part of a sort of sharing economy, right? We want to get it out to the world, um, but for someone else then to profit off of the work that we're doing and to profit by selling it to corporate entities that we don't know um, makes me really, really, really nervous. So Humanities Commons, stick around for the workshop and I will show you how it works. Thank you. You bet. So any other questions, uh, please? Uh, uh, I have a question in the Yes, chat. Button, go ahead, button. Yeah, like, uh, you know, it's overwhelming to really uh, be acquainted or, or know all these solutions and all these, uh, uh, like, applications that are being proposed to uh, academia. Or, but what about if a faculty member approves to use a, a commercial uh, mobile application that requires an institutional uh, account and it's mm. a commercial it's it's for free but it is commercial it sells advertisements right so, so what what do you think where should we put the limits like <laughs> I mean, this is a really interesting question, and I think it, it, it raises a whole lot of institutional policy issues that are somewhat above my pay grade. Um, but I, I will tell you what happens at, um, at my institution. Um, anytime we want to open an account that has implications for MSU, right? If it has to have some kind of institutional connection, um, if it can potentially connect to our network, if there are any kinds of issues that require MSU to be the signatory um, to an agreement to open an account, we're required to um, submit this really obnoxious form um, to our central IT unit called the IT readiness form. And um, what we have to do is demonstrate um, in this form, you know, that, that the technology involved is secure, um, that there aren't potential HIPAA or FERPA violations. Again, those US laws that govern healthcare information and education information. Um, that there aren't potential security risks for the MSU network, right? It's not going to unleash malware on the network um, and other things besides. And they do some investigation um, and then will either approve or deny um, the request for the account. Now, all of that 
is from the perspective of central IT, which again is all about security and making sure that, you know, that we're not going to run afoul of federal law or infect the network with something dangerous. They're way less concerned than I am about ethics, right? And so I think it, it would be delightful if we could institute a similar process that would do a sort of ethical review of these packages and determine, like, is this something that meets with our values? Is this a, a company that we really want to support? Is this, you know, is this yet another package from Elsevier that's going to end up charging us more and more and more until we can't afford um, to, to do the other kinds of work that our institutions need to do in the humanities and so forth? So, you know, this is this is um, something an ongoing conversation, let me say, on my campus um, about like supplementing um, the current security review with that kind of ethical review. Um, but I, I will tell you, it's not easy. It's not easy. And I know particularly with faculty in medical research, um, they they have a lot of power on campus and they uh, the entities that support medical research like Elsevier and like a bunch of the other major scientific publishers and organizations um, have a lot of clout. And so it, it is necessary in some sense um, for those faculty to make a big sacrifice um, if, if they want to uphold the ethical principles that we're trying to instantiate on campus. Um, it's not easy, it's not easy, but um, that those are my suggestions. Okay, thank you very much, thank you. You bet. So we still have time for one or two more questions. Uh, Can I ask something? Yes, please. Okay. Oh, sorry. So, so Jeff was raising his hand. So oh, go, go ahead. Go ahead, sorry. Yeah. Go ahead, Demetrius. Uh, yes. Yeah, I just wanted to ask: uh, Is faculty at uh, MSU using um, this platform, the the Commons platform, or part of it, or yeah? How did it come um, about? So. Uh, Recently, so in the last few years, I mean, obviously, I worked for the Modern Language Association um, when we originally launched Humanities Commons. And when I moved to MSU, we started a very long process of transitioning um, the Commons to MSU. So it now lives here with me. Um, part of the deal in bringing the Commons to MSU was that we were going to pilot an institutional instance um, of the Commons. So we have MSU Commons here on campus, um, which is connected to the Commons as a whole, um, and which we're still in a pilot phase with, but I believe in the fall we're going to be rolling into full launch. Um, and uh, faculty here are using it. Um, we have um, several faculty in history and in art history who've been using it to host classes. Um, and so they have their students creating websites um, on the commons and are able to do a lot of work that way. We have several research labs um, that have created um, uh, that the members of the research labs have created an account and then they've created a group for their research lab so that they can share materials there and work together in that group and then have a site that kind of shares public facing information um, from the lab as well. We're in the process right now, and this I'm super excited about. Um, there is a group of STEM educators on campus. Um, so it's all um, folks from across all of the sciences, engineering and math on campus, but who are fundamentally focused on the, 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 the undergraduate instruction and the teaching in their fields. And that group um, is starting to work on the commons and is so they, they've got a, a group on MSU commons where they're sharing their work. Um, and then they're about to launch, uh, at least 
let me put it this way. We have a grant proposal in, and if the grant proposal comes through, we're going to launch a, a, an open site where around the world, any STEM educator can join and, and do the same kinds of um, work sharing and, um, and, and com communication and collaboration through that network. Um, and that's going to be led by this group at MSU. So yeah, it, it is being used. Um, and it's in fact being used, MSU never had an institutional repository. Um, so one of the selling points in bringing the commons to MSU was, look, you can take advantage of the repository that's already here, right? And the institution doesn't have to maintain its own. We can use the larger disciplinary and interdisciplinary repository. And that's um, that's gotten a lot of traction on campus. So. Uh, Thank you. Um, Jeff, would you like to, yeah, unmute. Yeah, Kathleen, thanks for the thanks for the really interesting talk. My question is um, whether there's any kind of value or opportunity for groups such as consortia to partner with humanities commons in some way, or is it primarily is the model really more for individual scholars and teachers to to contribute? Yeah. So the the individual accounts on the commons are meant for individual users right we want them to represent actual researchers or teachers or you know just interested people who want to participate in the kinds of conversations that are going on here um, but we have a wide range of ways for organizations and institutions to support the commons to join it and to create a presence um, there and um, we're working in particular right now on a model for for consortia so that um, platforms or so that groups like you know the big 10 universities in the United States rather than each of the 15 schools in the big 10 why there are 15 instead of 10 I don't know but you know history anyway um, oh no did we lose Kathleen uh. <laughs> Uh, she froze. She was about to create an instance for Amica. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> With no cost and full support. And <laughs> I'm guessing individuals get in for free, but if it's an institution, you have to contribute to the commons in some way. I think way, you right? are muted, Catherine. Yeah, I am. I have no idea what happened. Zoom just suddenly you were went away. Promises on your behalf. So we decided. <laughs> they were listening to your talk. They must have been. I don't know what that was all about. That was very weird. Anyway, sorry about that. Um, anyway, consortia can join at a discount. So that's the, the short answer. Um, can we fit in one more question, uh, Kathleen? Sure, yeah. sure. Evie, uh, can you please uh, unmute? Yeah. Excellent. Yes. Um, hi, Kathleen. Um, this was very exciting, very interesting. Thank you so much. Um, I have a question, and this has to do with um, Humanities Commons and the library. Quite a few of the people that are in this call today are librarians, academic librarians. So would like to know how does your libraries in MSU, how uh, does the library support these efforts? And what is yeah. the role that libraries play partnering and educating the community, et cetera? So please. Excellent. Start. Great, great, great question. Um, several of my closest collaborators on campus are in the library. And in fact, um, the, the larger team, Mesh Research, is a co-venture of the College of Arts and Letters and the MSU libraries. And so we've got folks from both sides collaborating to make sure that the platforms that we're, we're rolling out for scholarly communication are going to meet the campus's needs. Um, the librarians are working with us very closely on the rollout of of MSU Commons um, and are doing a lot of, of scholar education um, to help bring new users in and help us um, help us support the process. But beyond that, um, the librarians have been utterly invaluable in the following regard. Um, so when we first launched as MSU Commons, um, the, the taxonomy for subject areas that we built into the repository as a controlled vocabulary was derived 
derived from the subject area of vocabulary from the MLA International Bibliography, which means that it was like all literature, language, and culture all the time. Um, as we brought in new subject areas, brought in art history, we'd bring in a taxonomy from art history, right? We bring in, you know, et cetera, right? We, we kept sort of expanding that taxonomy on an ad hoc basis. Over the last year, we have engaged in a process of completely converting that subject area taxonomy over to FAST. Um, and so we're um, right on the cusp. We're, in fact, in the next week, I think, going to be doing the final conversion of everything that's in the repository to FAST subject areas, which are based on the Library of Congress. Um, and um, in that process, we're going to be opening up subject areas for any field on campus that anybody wants to be contributing um, content in. Um, the, the library has been absolutely crucial in, first of all, helping us choose the FAST um, terminology as the, the, the metadata to use, um, in helping us do a mapping of our old taxonomy to the new one, um, and in helping us really understand like how this new one should be used. Um, so that, that has been absolutely crucial. And then again, having the library as the central point on campus that can talk about the commons with anyone who comes in um, has been super, super helpful to us. Um, yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kathy. You bet. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kathleen. And this was, this was so inspiring and the comments are so exciting.